I think we'll go straight to acknowledgement of country because we've got great see and I really don't want to spend too much time on the admin side. So if we could go straight to acknowledgement of country and over to you, Anna. Absolutely. So I just wanted to acknowledge today that regardless of where you are in Australia, this meeting is being held on traditional and sacred land. Florence, who's Nicholas's beautiful nine-year-old daughter, is going to present the acknowledgement of country for us. I would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and future, for they hold the memories, traditions, culture and hopes for Indigenous Australia. Today we stand on the Union Bear land. Thanks Florence. So we've got a really diverse range of speakers today in the sense that Modern slavery is very much at the core of what they are doing, but the way that they're kind of addressing it within their own industries is very unique. So we've got Elaine, who is a senior leader of leader legal. And I think you've just muted yourself accidentally. Sorry, a couple of tech technical issues. I think Microsoft might be. There we go. Better. Perfect. Can you hear me now? No. All good, Anna. Yep, we can hear you can loud hear and clear. Country, then, I'm assuming, or do you could hear that? No, we heard the acknowledgement of country. Thank you. Just after that, you dropped into mute. OK, so today we've got um, quite a diverse range of speakers in the sense that modern slavery is very much at the core of what they're doing, but in their own industries, they're addressing it all in very different ways. So we've got Elaine, uh, who should be joining us first. She's a senior leader of legal and governance, sustainability and human rights at the Benevolent Society. James, who is a professor of global politics and anti-slavery at Nottingham University, and Todd, who is the director of business and government engagement in the modern slavery and human trafficking branch at the Australian Border Force. Uh, so Elaine, I'll stop sharing my screen for you now if you would like to jump on and present. Hi all, can everyone see the slide deck? Yeah, okay, great. Okay, so um, I'll just introduce myself. My name is um, Elaine Leong. I'm the Group General Counsel and Group Company Secretary at the Benevolent Society. Um, I also lead, um, I have the privilege of leading the human rights um, and modern slavery agenda across the organisation. And I too would like to acknowledge the land um, that we're all on. I'm on Gadigal land and I extend my um, that acknowledgement and pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that acknowledgement to all the locations where I'm um, dialing in from today. Um, I'm here really to talk to you about um, our organisational approach to tackling um, modern slavery um, and in particular what we mean when we say we adopt a human rights approach to modern slavery. It's a phrase I've seen quite a lot and I thought it would be interesting to kind of share with you like in the context of our organisation what it means when we say we adopt a human rights approach. Um, today my purpose is to give you some really pragmatic examples that I hope that goes away and inspires you in terms of what you might be doing. And later when we do the chat, I'm keen to actually learn from you as well as to, to what you're doing. Um, what I wanted to say on the outset is that when we first considered the new modern slavery uh, legislation, the organisation, we really asked ourselves, um, did we want to consider this from a compliance and risk perspective? Or do we see this as an opportunity? And for an organisation like the Benevolent Society, it seemed um, very appropriate that we take that, that latter option and that we see it as an opportunity. And when I'm referring to um, opportunity, I'm talking about um, being curious, uh, being curious about what modern slavery is and what an organisation like the Benevolent Society can do to advance this really important global but also local issue. 
our organization has said um, from the outset, we're not here to kind of set out the most polished modern slavery statement. We don't profess to achieve the most in tackling modern slavery. What's really important for us as an organization is that uh, we recognize it's a continuous learning journey and we want the whole organization to come along this journey. So we don't want this um, modern slavery agenda uh, to only exist in legal or to only exist in procurement or rolled up into a standalone board report. We want all our staff um, and our, indeed the Benevolent Society community to come along. So right from the start, our kind of what I would call our big, hairy, audacious goal has been that if anyone approaches any one of our staff, volunteers, community partners, suppliers, that, it, that if they were to ask us about, you know, modern slavery, our people would be able to confidently answer, yep, that's a really important issue to the Benevolent Society. I know my role in this important issue, and if you're interested, you can find out more by going to the Benevolent Society website. So that's been our goal, and that continues to be the goal that we work towards today. Um, what I might do is, because I think I'm having some connectivity issue, I'm actually going to turn my camera off, but I'll leave my presentation slide deck so you can follow as well. Um, so just a little bit about the Benevolent Society, because I'm not sure how many people have heard of us, um, but we are we an Australian charity. Uh, we were established in 1813. We have a very old history, obviously. Um, some of us will know us as advocating for prohibition of child labour in New South Wales, um, and we're known to have introduced the old age pension. Some of you might know us as having, having run the women's hospital, um, the first um, women's hospital of its kind um, in Australia. Today we run services for children, young people, families, older people and people with disability. Um, we don't specifically run services for victim survivors of modern slavery. But of course, because of the work that we do, they come within our service reach. So it, we sometimes might come across a victim survivor in like a child protection programs, for example. We also run two advocacy initiatives. Um, Every Child is a national advocacy movement that aims to elevate the conversation about the wellbeing of children and young people. And the other one is um, Every Age, which tackles um, ageism against older Australians. So as you can see, the core work of the Benevolent Society naturally lends itself for us to adopt a human rights approach. Um, and the work we do every day at the Benevolent Society, it's founded on rights. But like many other service providers, we don't explicitly turn our mind to human rights. Uh, a lot of service providers um, will refer to their work as helping people, not so much as um, explicitly upholding rights. But we are seeing there's a shift in this language, particularly in view of the series of um, recommendations coming out from recent Royal Commissions that have a recommendation uh, focused on human rights. Um, so for the last few years now, we've been leading a program of work that aims to make human rights more explicit um, in our organisation and to strengthen our rights-based approach. Our key message has been to remind people that they're actually doing this work every day. It's not something new to them. It's just a different framing of the work that they do. So every day our people are protecting and upholding human rights without probably even naming it. And that's something we continually to remind them um, right from national office, not just like our frontline um, practitioners. So right from national office to our service delivery. The other thing I'll say um, is that the Benevolent Society, um, our services and our work is delivered solely in Australia. Um, and our supply chain is also predominantly in Australia. So it would have been an easy assumption for an organisation like us to consider that our starting point in the context of modern slavery is low risk. Um, but we didn't make that assumption. Uh, rather, rather than making that assumption, our question was, um, Elaine, your mic Sorry, I think I got muted by accident. Can everyone hear? Yeah. So I was just saying that rather than making the assumption that modern slavery is low risk for an organisation that's based in Australia, only delivering um, services to Australians and has a supply chain that's predominantly Australian, the question we asked was how is it relevant? So how is modern slavery relevant to us? And what can we do in terms of, um, you know, having an impact or some change to this to this agenda. And that's kind of what led us to um, uh, adopting a human rights lens on modern slavery. I think there's just a bit of echo, so. 
If everyone that's not a speaker could please mute themselves, that'd be greatly appreciated. Elaine, you're still muted, just so you know. OK, so. I thought I would also just quickly share with you um, what we mean when we say we're adopting a human rights approach to our work and making human rights explicit. So you'll see I've taken this page out of our strategic plan and we talk about building human rights in our culture, which I've kind of circled there for you to see. Um, so we want to place human rights at the centre of what we do and front of mind for our people. And our focus is fostering human rights in our culture and not just considering human rights um, as a tick box or distinct from what we do. So in the context of tackling modern slavery specifically, it means we're talking about taking a broader approach and considering the full spectrum of the benevolent society's human rights and impacts on our activities and business relationships, because we know that modern slavery is a serious violation of individual dignity and human rights, and that we're dealing with mod when we're dealing with modern slavery, we're dealing with a range of rights that have or been violated in the most severe way. And this is how we're building uh, a culture of understanding and awareness of modern slavery across um, the benevolent society. That's that's what we mean when we talk about a human rights approach. Um, so if we were to drill down what a human rights culture looks like, I won't have time today to talk through these common traits, but we've adopted these principles as our way of breaking down a human rights culture. So this is what was called the panel approach, which is originated, I understand, from Scotland for healthcare settings, and then it was adapted for a broader national dementia strategy and then approaches to historical abuse and then more generally to providers of human services. Here in Australia, the Australian Human Rights Commission has been advocating this, this approach to businesses. And what we've done is we've, we've kind of adapted the panel approach to ADA-S to talk about safeguarding human rights explicitly. Um, so again, I won't be able to go through these common traits with you, but basically what we're doing is we're working really hard to deeply embed these common traits in our organisational thinking, decision-making and action right across our governance, service delivery relationships and environment. The next few slide decks, um, I won't go through in detail, but I thought what I would do is I would put the information in the slide deck. So for those who are interested, who can look at it later. But um, this one is really just sharing with you um, the, KP the KPIs that we've set are in the broad areas of governance, supply chain, internal capability, service delivery and sector collaboration. And what I'm really trying to demonstrate here is that, um, and I've just shared with you a few key highlights in those areas, is that it really is a journey for us. We haven't um, you know, embarked on this journey, expecting to change things overnight. Um, but probably the one thing I did just want to point out is um, we didn't go to rush to launch a human rights and modern slavery policy. We did um, quite a bit of work leading up to it to ensure that it doesn't just exist in a policy, a portfolio or a department, that the work was done to lay the foundations for it to be across the whole organisation before we actually... Um, uh, like went to launch a policy because our concern was launching a policy on its own will start framing it in a way where it only exists in that framework, in, in that portfolio. So that's just something I wanted to point out. Um, the next two slides um, really is just, this slide is something that um, our wonderful paralegal uh, Freya puts together. Um, Accountability is a key aspect to our governing framework for human rights and modern slavery, and it's something we want to share with the organisation. So often we, not just in the modern slavery statement, but uh, often throughout the year, we'll share with um, the organisation how we're going in terms of the things that we set out. And this is an example of an infographic that we might share uh, with the, the organisation. The other thing we share is um, lessons learnt, but I'm going to share that with you a little bit later in this presentation. The other thing that's worth just very quickly pointing out is kind of safeguarding the stakeholder voice is so important in this journey of um, human rights and modern slavery and making sure you map out kind of your stakeholder engagement, the voice for stakeholders there, your grievance mechanisms is a really important point in the context of modern slavery, but also if you're dealing with the wider UN guiding principles on business and human rights. 
Um, this next slide, I'm just conscious of time. Um, I wanted to share with you that the other focus we've been um, working on over the last um, uh, 18 months is life cycle mapping. Um, so we've been undertaking life cycle mapping in the consideration of our directors, employees, volunteers, community partners, suppliers, and I'm just sharing with you now our a very high level life cycle mapping of our employee journey, um, because I guess I think there's been a lot of focus on supply chain, and that's why I made a conscious uh, decision not to focus on supply chain in this presentation, but to talk about like the culture and how to embed this in our culture. Um, so what you see here is basically all the critical touch points in the employee life cycle on when they might engage with modern slavery, irrespective of the role that they have at the Benevolent Society. So we'll have reference to our culture, our human rights culture in, you know, um, uh, job ads at the recruit at the recruitment stage. Onboarding, there is um, there is reference to human rights and modern slavery. A uh, new employee joining the Benevolent Society within the first month, they have to join a human rights clinic where we do a bit of a deep dive with them on human rights and modern slavery. And in particular, we will take them through some case studies where we'll kind of outline indicators to them and where how they might come across um, some of these important issues. We also, for our executives and senior leaders, they undertake a human rights decision making clinic, which is where they kind of learn about the um, uh, how to make decisions that are compatible with human rights. Um, and some of you may be familiar with that framework, um, but that's a big part of our human rights framework um, at the moment. Um, we also have a library of resources um, and we have a workplace discussion forum where um, employees can, can discuss like issues arising that they might see, you know, in the media or otherwise. Um, throughout the year, we 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 launch we're going to launch an internal campaign this year. But throughout the year, we we didn't want to just launch one campaign in the year and then go silent. So this we have a calendar of significant days where we it's a reminder to people about these these particular issues. And then of course, like many organisations who have joined today, we have a human rights and modern slavery committee. Um, uh, which is championed by representatives across the organisation and they will do portfolio updates um, throughout the year. So that's a very kind of very, very quick um, overview of our employee life cycle and how we try to make sure there are various touch points for those issues um, along the way for an employee. I also just wanted to quickly share with you um, in terms of our library of resources, um, it's quite a library at the moment, um, but the ones that are worth pointing out is we've got a series on um, human rights, which goes through like what is the right, how is the right relevant to um, our workers and how do they, what's the connection to modern slavery? Um, so that's something um, that we've, we've been building over the last 18 months and we'll probably complete it um, this reporting period. Um, we have a modern slavery easy read guide, which is really important to our frontline practitioners and our clients as well. So that's probably one of our most um, popular guides that we have. Uh, we have a human rights assessment tool, which is which is a little bit probably um, technical, so I won't go through that today. But the other thing that I thought was worth pointing out is that we uh, we did we developed a modern slavery team activity toolkit, uh, which is which is really popular amongst our teams, which is a toolkit of various um, activities where um, small teams can talk about how the work that they do impacts or um, is relevant to the issue of modern slavery. Now, there's a great saying that goes something like, um, if you go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I think it really demonstrates um, the impact of collaborations. And certainly at the Benevolent Society, we couldn't achieve impact without collaborations. And in the context of modern slavery, I thought I would just share, I think the last time I was here in this forum, I was part of the audience and I shared um, our modern slavery community partner toolkit which is a toolkit we've developed for those community partners that actually um, that actually are very small. They don't reach the threshold for reporting, but because of government grants or philanthropic um, funding, they might be required to, um, to consider this area or indeed because they think it's the right thing to do, but they don't know where to start. So we've developed that community partner toolkit for the smaller sized um, organisations. Um, we also chair and facilitate a modern slavery charities and not-for-profit forum, which is a forum for like shared learning and advocacy in our sector. Uh, we meet quarterly. 
when we initiated this forum, it was really for charities and not for profits. Um, but certainly in the short term future, we are wanting to look at um, collaborations with um, government, private sector. So if you are interested in collaborating um, with members of this um, forum, which I can give you details later, please feel free to get in touch. I also thought just very quickly to share with you, if you are thinking of partnering or collaborating with an NGO or charity, the ACNC Charity Register is a really good starting point for due diligence. So the ACNC is the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission. Um, they've been around for a number of years. They're our regulator. Their register has recently been enhanced um, so that it provides details on activities, um, where a charity operates, financials, board memberships, um, charity and tax endorsement status. So that's a good starting point if you're kind of looking at whether or not um, uh, we're going to not sorry what you whether you're wanting to partner with a particular charity or just doing general due diligence on a charity and again I'll send those details through and they can be they can be sent out um, I thought to end this um, this presentation I would just share with you some of the lessons learned over the years for us um, being that um, firstly it's not a linear process like our commitment to embracing and embedding human rights means we're constantly evaluating and re-evaluating re risk to people, particularly when considering we're dealing with COVID, floods now, bushfires. Um, increasing organisational capability on human rights decision making also takes time. Um, it can be a very technical process. Um, and then partnerships is key. I think we've spoken about that. I think particularly if you're working in charity and dealing with human services, there are blurred lines when it comes to trying to distinguish between protecting, promoting and respecting human rights. Um, and then probably just circling back to that point on deep listening to victim survivor voice is really necessary and an essential starting point to kind of an authentic journey in this space. I would really encourage people to consider that. I thought I would just, I won't talk about this um, slide too much, except to say that um, like a lot of organisations, we've un started to undertake um, a big mapping exercise around our sustainable development goals. As part of that exercise, we are identifying our salient human rights issues. Modern slavery we've identified so far is one um, for us to watch, um, you know, guided by the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Um, that's something that we're hoping um, to continue to advance and again it kind of brings another sphere of learning for this for this organization for those of you who have joined i think there are a couple of human service providers here the other other area that i thought would be worth mentioning is we are producing some guides specifically for families and communities um, in the next 12 months uh, one would be around the connection between coercive control and modern slavery, so the connection there. And the other one we're looking at is really um, for parents and carers. If they wanted to start talking to their children about modern slavery, how, how would you start that, that conversation? Really, that's um, what I wanted to cover today. And I think I'm going to hand back to you, Nicholas. Is that right? Absolutely. Thanks, uh, Elaine, for sharing that with us. Some very good uh, resources there. Well done. I really appreciate that. And uh, we've had a lot of questions that we'll cover off um, when we come to the Q&A. And I think good, good time to introduce James, our second speaker today. Absolutely. I will just share my screen again. And we'll jump into James's presentation. Thanks so much, Nicholas. Thanks, Anna. Wonderful to be with you all today. Uh, I want to begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you today from the traditional lands of the Arakwal people of the Bundjalung Nation uh, here in the Northern Rivers, uh, which has obviously been an area very uh, hit very hard by uh, climate change recently. But I want to acknowledge also what it means to speak to you about this issue, Xinjiang, from this place, the traditional lands of the Bundjalung people. We need to acknowledge not only that the land uh, that I'm speaking you to from uh, was the foundation for the economy here in the Northern Rivers in Southeast Queensland, but also that the, uh, the involuntary labour of First Nations people and indeed of Pacifica people blackbirded from the South Pacific to this region and uh, was a foundation for the economy here 
and that that was part of a larger set of policies about economic development and assimilation uh, that guided our uh, development of our political economy around here. That's really important to understand when we think about the reasons why we see such severe forced labor and human rights risks in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. So let me begin by asking why we should care here in Australia about this problem that I'm going to talk to you today. As I'll describe in a minute, it's a severe human rights risk and that activates your responsibility to respect human rights as described in the UN guiding principles and the relevant OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. But even more fundamentally than that, it's a risk exposure for your business potentially. As Anna's showing here on the slide, Xinjiang is the source of 20% of the world's cotton, 18% of the world's tomatoes, and 45% of an element called polysilicon, uh, which is uh, a fundamental component of solar panels. Uh, Anna, there's just a problem apparently with the way the slides are being displayed. So uh, uh, if we could uh, maybe have a look at that as we go along, that would be great. Can you um, and if we could go back to, to that, uh, that slide, um, or maybe the third slide, that would be great. The one that says why at the top. Can you say that now? Yes, thank you. I think so. Um, so this is a problem for any business that ha is importing or exposed to cotton, tomatoes, or indeed solar power. So even companies that are buying solar power as part of an abatement issue. But it's not only those supply chains where Xinjiang is implicated. Uh, in fact, Xinjiang uh, Uyghur Autonomous Region labor is exported to other parts of China and therefore uh, there are forced labor risks in numerous supply chains that run through China, uh, including electronics uh, and many others. Now, why has Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, which I'll just call Xinjiang from now on, why has that become so central uh, a problem of forced labor? Well, essentially as part of its governance strategy, the Chinese Communist Party over the last decade has poured resources into the region and turned it into a low cost business hub. So low cost land, low cost electricity, the solar panels that come out of uh, Xinjiang are made with polysilicon generated with coal fired electricity, extremely high emission electricity uh, and uh, low cost labor. And that's the central problem from a modern slavery perspective. This is a program or a policy called the Surplus Rural Labour Program. It essentially coerces Uyghurs and other minority workers off the land, out of their traditional land uh, lifestyle into industrialized work. And in doing that, it moves them often uh, either directly into forced labour or through a system of coercive control in uh, internment. The best reports suggest that over a million people have been detained in this way. Uh, we know now from both first-hand testimony, from documents, from numerous sources, that this is leading to widespread and severe human rights abuses. We're not just talking forced labor, we're talking physical and sexual assault, forced sterilization, forced disappearances, uh, torture, a number of other grave and severe uh, human rights abuses. The program to move some of these people into industrial labor in private employ, subsidized by the state, works not only in Xinjiang, but in factories and work sites throughout China, including in the East. So as I said, supply chains operating out of factories in the East of China may also be exposed to these kinds of risks. Now, traditionally, the way we deal with these kinds of problems in supply chains is through uh, audits through social audits, human rights due diligence on the ground. But that is essentially impossible in Xinjiang now and seems to be impossible in relation to this program in other parts of China. When I say impossible, what I mean is that professional companies that have been doing this kind of work in China are now exposed to harassment, uh, abuse, doxing, detainment, detention of the individuals conducting the work and their family members confiscation of assets, raids, seizure of documents, and all of that under color of law as a result of uh, new laws brought in in China over the last 18 months. So it's essentially impossible to conduct human rights due diligence in that way, raising some difficult 
uh, policy questions for us all. I want to emphasize that although the Chinese uh, Communist Party argues that none of these policies violate their obligations, legislatures around the world and recently the ILO Committee of Experts found that in fact it does violate international legal obligations, that there are at least four of the 11 ILO indicators of forced labor present uh, and that according to the UK parliament, for example, this amounts to genocide, uh, certainly crimes against humanity. So in terms of the human rights risk you might be exposed to, this is the most severe type of risk you could be exposed to. Next slide, please. So what are governments doing about this? Well, over 300 binding measures have been proposed, adopted, or in fact been adopted and then expired to date. We've documented these in a data set at xinjiangsanctions.info. Uh, it includes not only the over 300 measures from Western governments, but also the 50 Chinese countermeasures where the, fifth, where the governments, uh, where the Chinese Communist Party sanctioned uh, Western actors. And next week, we'll be releasing both updates to those data sets and a new corporate responses data set that documents the responses of 250 companies. Uh, to these allegations. Next slide, please. In this slide, you can see just a little bit of information about who's been adopting these measures. So you can see that the majority have in force have been adopted in the United States, but there are a wide range of other countries that have already adopted binding measures. This is only binding legal measures, not political statements. Australia has currently adopted none, but as, as I'll come back to in a moment, there are some important uh, considerations in place in Parliament at the moment that might change that. Next slide, please. What kind of measures are these? Well, they cover everything from uh, asset restrictions, asset freezes, through to business guidance, through to import and export bans. Next slide, please. I wanted to just take a couple of minutes to highlight some of the most important measures that are in the mix these days. A couple from the United States to begin with. First, there is in place in the United States a provision under the Tariff Act that allows the government to exclude goods that it believes uh, were made in whole or in part with forced labor. And it has measures in place specifically to exclude cotton, tomatoes and selected solar products. Last year, 912 such shipments were excluded, and that was uh, covered goods worth several billion dollars. The value of the goods seized is going up dramatically. Congress has given more money to the part of uh, customs that deals with this, and this is now having a demonstration effect overseas. Not only that, uh, late last year, the Congress adopted a new law that from June of this year will exclude any good uh, that is made uh, with forced labor in uh, by uh, Uyghur forced labor in China. So that covers all of the things I was talking about, cotton, tomatoes, solar panels, and is expected to have a really dramatic effect. It puts the onus on the importer to demonstrate that its goods were not made with forced labor. And of course, that's going to have important implications, not only for retailers, but also potentially for investors uh, and even, frankly, for banks who may be banking businesses that are exposed to that kind of risk. The EU is now considering something similar, not a customs ban, but a product withdrawal instrument. So any good that is on the single market in the EU found to be made in whole or in part with forced labour will be forced to be taken off the market. And it recently published new human rights due diligence uh, proposals in the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Initiative, which is now before the EU Parliament. So that will, if it passes, and it's expected to pass later this year, uh, require corporations operating in the EU to conduct detailed mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence and attach civil liability if they fail to do that. How about here in Australia? Well, the key thing to know about here is that our parliament in Canberra is considering a forced labour ban for goods made anywhere in the world, except Australia, I should note, uh, with forced labour. It's unlikely that's going to pass before the election, almost certain, I would say, but it is very likely that it will be picked up uh, whichever party is in power after the election and that debate will be taken forward. So it's quite likely, you see the direction of travel here, is that 
companies in Australia are going to be operating in environment, both in Australia and in some of our key markets abroad, where these kinds of issues are moving from the voluntary disclosure much more to the mandatory due diligence context. But in a context, as I said, where doing due diligence on the ground is essentially impossible, which means we have to start thinking about moving supply from Xinjiang, from parts of China where they're using the surplus uh, uh, rural labor program to other, uh, other sources of supply. So in some forthcoming work we're about to publish, uh, if we could go to the next slide, we think about what are the impacts of these, uh, what are the impacts of these sanctions today? Now, the key thing to understand here is they differ by sector. Xinjiang's role in different sectors is quite different. It's the source of 45% of polysilicon, but only 18% of tomatoes. And tomatoes are pretty substitutable. Tomatoes grown in Australia are fairly substitutable on quality, for tomatoes grown in Xinjiang. So it's much more a competition uh, on price. Now, generally across different markets, what we see is three different types of things happening. And the literature calls this trade reallocation, when exporters decide they can't reach a certain market because of an import ban, so they have to reallocate to another market. Secondly, trade diversion. So they still go to the same market, but they go through an intermediary country. Um, and third, product transformation. They have to change the product so it's not made with forced labor in the first place. And that's obviously, ultimately, what these policies are designed to achieve, product transformation. So how is that going? Well, in the, in the research we're about to publish, we find that in the tomato sector, uh, what we're mainly seeing is trade diversion. So goods from Xinjiang are still reaching European Western shelves but they're going through other markets and they're essentially mixed with water, repackaged as goods made in Italy is a key intermediary market, or indeed Russia was a key intermediary market, but that's obviously likely to change now. Next slide, please. Cotton, what about cotton? In that case, what we see is both trade diversion through intermediary countries like Bangladesh and reallocation. So goods from Xinjiang aren't going anymore to Western markets in some cases, they're being absorbed in particular by the Chinese markets. But some purchasers see the product that comes from northern Xinjiang in particular, which is long staple cotton, as non-substitutable. So they can't find alternative sources of supply. And they're really grappling with these difficult questions of how they deal in this case with this severe human rights risk. The extra challenge we have in the garment and retail apparel sector is that if you are selling not only in uh, Western Europe or Australia, but also in China, so if you're a big retailer like Nike or H&M or someone like that, you are facing potentially a major backlash in China from consumers and from the government for acknowledging that there are forced labor concerns in Xinjiang. So as a result, we're beginning to see a very difficult choice for some of these uh, global retailers about how they uh, deal with a Chinese government pushing them to deny forced labor concerns in Xinjiang and Western markets, not only governments, but markets, investors that are insisting that they grapple with this problem. And we haven't solved for that yet, but the key solution is probably around uh, developing new sources of supply. And that brings us uh, to uh, solar sector. Now, I think this is, next slide, please. This is a major sleeper issue for Australia. Of 80% of our solar uh, panels come from China, and it's not easy to turn on alternative supply because of the sunk costs in uh, solar panel manufacturing, and in particular, polysilicon, which is the key element of the solar panels that comes from Xinjiang. So what we see, though, is that the manufacturers in the middle of this supply chain are now beginning to develop a bifurcated supply chain. They have clean plants in places like Vietnam that don't use Chinese polysilicon, that don't use forced labor, that produce clean solar panels that they're going to be exporting to the West. But those same manufacturers have dirty plants using forced labor, using Xinjiang polysilicon to, to produce solar panels for consumption in markets that aren't imposing this requirement, particularly uh, in, in China. This is a recipe, as you can see, for increased costs for reduced uh, for, for slower uptake of solar, for reduced innovation, and for geopolitics, frankly. 
So we need to be thinking about ways that we can manage uh, these kinds of issues uh, along the solar supply chain, solar value chain. And as a result, the financial sector investors, which are obviously exposed to solar in a big way, are becoming increasingly involved. And we may see, as our research that we'll publish in a couple of weeks uh, discusses in more detail, we may see a move towards a multi-stakeholder approach. But as I've said, the way that you build solar panels is uh, it requires big capital expenditure, long lead times in capacity. This is an industrial policy question. And so it necessarily is going to require the involvement of government and in fact, governments plural, given the transnational nature of this value chain. So this isn't something that business can solve on its own, but that's not to say there isn't a role for business and that in fact, business can sit on its hands and wait. Not to address this problem now would frankly be not just a question of modern slavery risk, but a strategic risk for organizations that have exposure to this. Under the Modern Slavery Act in Australia, directors have to sign off on statements, Modern Slavery Act statements. So if you're not addressing these risks and you're exposed to them and your directors are signing off on that, that raises some pretty interesting legal questions, which I know civil society actors are now beginning to think about in terms of potential liability exposure for failing to disclose uh, what are potentially material risks, given the questions around market access and impact on share price, for example. Next slide. Uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll be releasing uh, a new report uh, which looks in depth at these questions around the solar industry and offers a new approach to estimating forced labor risk in the solar energy production mix of, of different countries. And on this slide, I'm giving you the first sneak peek uh, at the results, some of the key results in this report, which estimate the forced labor risk uh, present in the solar energy production on-grid photovoltaic uh, for the top 30 solar producing countries in the world. On the left, you have forced labor risk per kilowatt hour, and on the right, you have forced labor risk per US dollar of levelized cost of electricity. Happy to share more uh, about that in Q&A or later on. Next slide. The last point I want to make is about the, the key issues that re remain unresolved. We're operating now in this environment of these proliferating sanctions, but are they having the intended impact? Will they actually change forced labor risks on the ground? The challenge with solar is that if we end up with a bifurcated supply chain, yes, buyers may be insulated from modern slavery risk because they're no longer buying solar panels made with forced labor. But if those solar panels are still being made with forced labor and just sold to someone else, then we have to ask, are we actually reducing modern slavery risk? And if not, what kind of policies and practices do we need in place to really reduce risk to people, which is the key uh, objective here and the key objective required under the UN guiding principles. The second key question that's still not resolved, I'd have to say, is what really is feasible and expected? We're encouraging businesses in all other human rights risk areas to rely on due diligence. But in this uniquely severe uh, human rights risk area around Xinjiang, doing due diligence on the ground isn't just impossible, it's actually dangerous to people. So what are the alternatives and what is expected? So there are now leaders in industry developing sets of principles and expectations about disengagement from Xinjiang. Over what time period should businesses withdraw from what kinds of supply relationships? And how can they make themselves accountable for that kind of process of phased disengagement? The answer probably needs to be different according to different industries, because you have different approaches to substitutability, different uh, capex expenditure to develop new capacity, different role for government, depending on, for example, whether this is a strategic issue like solar is. Also, a key role is emerging for finance for investors uh, in particular. This is a key uh, issue for ESG risk assessment. And we're also beginning to see the insurance industry wake up to the risk this is posing uh, for them. In the US, we see some movement for sa sanctions to move into capital markets. What I mean by that is some restrictions placed on investors investing in uh, the specific firms 
that are connected to these modern slavery risks. If we see that happen in at, at scale, that will accelerate the need for the financial sector to get involved. Uh, but fundamentally, there's also a role for government here. So what we need is back to a point that Elaine uh, highlighted, key role for collaboration and partnerships, not only between business and civil society, but in this case, also with government involved. Um, so I thank you all for your time and attention. I look forward to the, the Q&A. Uh, and if you'd like to know more about all of this work and receive the reports that are coming down the pipe, please go to xinjiangsanctions.info. There's a very easy sign up form there and we look forward to engaging with you all in the future. Thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks, James. Uh, the questions have been coming in thick and fast. I'm really looking forward to that Q&A section, uh, but that's at the end. So we've got Todd Kleindienst from uh, ABF next. If uh, young, uh, young, Anna, if you just want to introduce Todd, please. Of course, Todd, if you would like to share your screen when you're ready. Todd, um, as I mentioned earlier, is the Director of Business and Government Engagement and is a part of the Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking Branch at the ABF. Thanks, Todd. Excellent. Excellent. Can people hear me? Yeah. That's a good start. And can you, can you see my screen? Am I sharing that screen yet? I can see it, yes. Excellent. Uh, okay, all right, so we've got the screen up, you can hear me. Uh, thank you very much, um, everybody. Um, it's uh, it's good to be here again, I was at the last one, so I really enjoy these sessions and it's great to see another, another great turnout. Um, what I'll do is um, I'd like to give a acknowledgement of country in the Nunawal language, is what we often do here uh, in the ACT. Uh, before I get started, Daura Nuna, Daura Nunawal, Yangu Nala Manyan Duni Manyan. Nunawalwari Daurawari Dindi Wangara Lejinyin. This is Nunawal country. Today we meet on Nunawal country. We acknowledge and pay our respects to the elders. Okay. Um, just a, again, a, a little bit of an introduction. It was said earlier that I uh, am the director of the Business and Government Engagement uh, Unit, uh, but I'm also part of the Modern Slavery and Human Trafficking Branch. And primarily that, that branch within the Australian Border Force sort of got three, just three key areas. You can see the context of what the ABF branch that I'm in is doing. We have an international capacity building component, which does work throughout our, our region to um, develop capacity to uh, deal with modern slavery, human trafficking. We have another element of our branch, which coordinates and drafts the national action plan uh, on dealing with modern slavery and human trafficking. So it runs intergovernmental uh, uh, committees and networks to draft that uh, national strategy uh, with, with the AFP, Fair Work Australia, Attorney General, lots of uh, um, other, other government bodies. And then you have my branch, uh, oh, sorry, my team within that branch. And uh, you have the Government Engagement Unit, which is responsible for the complying with the Modern Slavery Act for the Commonwealth, doing the Commonwealth Statement. So yeah, we also have to do a statement, So, um, which which is great to, for us to see what's what's involved and uh, yeah, it keeps us honest by everything, having to publish on the register our own statement. Um, then I have a business engagement uh, team, which uh, they're, the, they're the ones who sort of deal with what we're dealing with here today, primarily where they maintain the online register, that public register, uh, assess, uh, receive and assess all of those statements, uh, load them up on the register uh, and provide the help desk and provide guidance material, et cetera, all of that, um, and do sessions like these, you know, smaller sessions like these uh, around, the, around the country. And I also have a small part of my team, which will be responsible for uh, helping run the uh, Modern Slavery Act review this year. So uh, we're all pretty busy. It's going to be a pretty uh, busy year. So that's what my team is and where it fits in the big scheme of things. Uh, so I'll just give a, a, an update on just some, you know, sort of where we're at and, and some of the things, trends we're seeing and and, and where we're going. Um, I guess as most people people are aware, we have our online register for modern slavery statements. You can see it there. It's publicly available. I think it was the first of its kind uh, in, in the world, even though we didn't have the first Modern Slavery Act, this was the first of its kind. Um, and you can see there now the type of uh, input we're getting into that uh, modern slavery register where under the Act, uh, uh, Australian entities or entities doing business in Australia with a revenue grade of $100 million uh, you know, must submit a uh, modern slavery statement. Um, and but you can do them voluntary there as well, as you can see. But you can see there where we're at already in terms of we've had over 8,000 entities now covered by statements on the register. There's two Commonwealth statements in there. Um, we're 
busily preparing our third one now, um, and over 4,000 statements there lodged, just under 500 voluntary, and from 42 countries. And a key one there for us is that searches number there, you know, over 730,000 searches, because that's what this the Modern Slavery Act's intent was initially. You know, it's a trans it's a transparency framework uh, to fit in with a number of other strategies. Uh, so, with the aim being where people uh, have their statements uh, published on this web for everyone to see, and then they can go under, you know, I guess it's using, I guess, reputational risk uh, as one of the key drivers there is the, was the philosophy behind the um, Modern Slavery Act, and particularly with this, um, the registers way it is. Uh, so it's great to see there the number of searches and also the number of statements. Um, but it's certainly, I think some of the initial estimates were in early days when they were just thinking about the act, they thought there might be 3,000 entities or so that might need to lodge statements on this, but you can see there, it's now over 8,000. Yeah, so what are some of the reporting trends we've seen? Um, this has been uh, fairly consistent in terms of, you know, some of the, I've got there's what are some of the poor areas or what, what are what are people doing well? Um, and we're into our, we're into our, what is it now called our, uh, our, our second reporting period. The first reporting period just finished 30th of June last year uh, uh, due to a, a number of factors. There was, there was a COVID extension, there was, um, when they first kicked off, there was a number of different reporting uh, timelines people can do. That'd be the international one, the calendar year, or the Australian financial year. But the officially, the first reporting period ended of June uh, last year. Um, but these trends that I'm reporting on here were a lot of them were primarily for the uh, that first reporting period. But we're seeing uh, we're still seeing some of these in the in the second reporting period. Although we have uh, seen some improvements, which I'll address a little later. But what are some of the good things we see? Uh, that we see when our assessors are looking at the statements that come in, it is those ones that just clearly address those mandatory criteria for content, and often the, the good ones are those that uh, really spell spell out, you know, fairly basically either in a table or in a format what are, what are each of the criteria and, and what are we doing under each one uh, is often a, a marker of those better statements. Uh, other good things we're seeing is the ones that I guess this comes under mandatory criteria seven about other information, how they address the COVID nineteen impacts. Because uh, COVID-19, uh, as you know, a lot of research has shown, does uh, you know uh, impact uh, modern slavery and human trafficking, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a negative way. So uh, you know, the good statements have actions and what they're doing to address those in them. Uh, other good things we see are those that have the the case studies and practical examples. Uh, so they're really getting you know highlighting in a bit more detail how they do things uh, and what what they're doing. Uh, to, to mitigate risk and remediate. So, uh, so there is some really good uh, statements in there that, that highlight that. And the other ones too about setting out their, their plan for future action, how they're going to do that continuous improvement. So there's some of the, 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 the what we, good things that we're seeing. Uh, some of the not so good things we're seeing, um, we're still seeing where people or entities aren't indicating the principal governing body uh, for approval or the signature by a responsible member. Um, and we, we can't publish those um, statements because they you know, haven't really officially been approved so they always get bounced straight back and, and then need to come back correctly signed but we're, we're still seeing that coming through uh, a lot of the big ones where people are falling down on the mandatory criteria is not describing consultation and, and the key one there is it's con not just normal consultation it's actually or um, you know might have some great consultation mechanisms in their organization it's a consultation that was conducted the access uh, outlines in in developing that modern slavery statement so what was the consultation that occurred in developing that so well entities fall over on that uh, another one is that focusing on risk in the supply chains to the exclusion of risk in in, in their uh, onshore operations or their yeah you know, within their operations so it's not just about supply chains uh, the modern slavery act as well it is about operations so that needs to be covered as well and the last one is not defining how the entity assesses the effectiveness of actions taken to combat modern slavery. Again, the act doesn't require people to say we are, you know, we are effective. It's describing how they're assessing that effectiveness uh, and what they're doing about it. So there's there the key reporting trends of what's what we're seeing that's good, what we're seeing that's consistently, or more often than not, uh, when you have when you have a statement that's not uh, compliant, what, what, what the uh, issues are. You know, so, so for you know, future reporting, I really want to see uh, you know, those areas of improvement that I've just described there uh, being addressed and worked on um, to continue the trend of improved compliance. Um, another one too is yeah, that increasing sophistication of responses. Remember, the, uh, a, a lot of the analysis has been done recently has been on um, entities' first 
Commonwealth statements. So remember, you know, four or five years ago, you know, there was no uh, statements. Now we've got over 4,000, uh, which is good. But now we need to see, obviously, an increase in sophistication of responses. And that goes for Commonwealth as well. You'll see our, our second statement is a little bit more sophisticated than our first statement. And we need to keep that progress going now for ourselves of, as we um, uh, go through the different tiers and get, get understand our tier, supply chain tiers better than to increase the sophistication of our response. Uh, so we'd like to see that. And the other one there is that increase in collaboration. And I think it was just touched a bit on in you know, some of the previous presentations too. Um, you know, collaboration in this space is key, whether it be within the organisation, people you know, shouldn't be creating these statements in isolation, but, uh, you know, other external collaboration activities as well uh, is important to see more of. And that's, you know, events such as this, or I think it's been talked about earlier that these sorts of problems don't get solved by, you know, government working their own or business or civil society. It's all three uh, working together. And then we can see, you know, even now globally, it's when those three work together, uh, you can start to have a, an effect, that joint effect, when you have government, business and civil society uh, working together. So collaboration is key. We need more of it and we're keen for it. Uh, but a bit on the, um, you know, compliance with the Act. So, so we, we are seeing an improvement uh, of compliance from the first reporting period through that second reporting period, which we're in now, which will end in uh, you know, June 30 this year. And we hope to see this uh, trend continue as understanding and awareness continues uh, to increase, you know, what, what do I mean by what are some of the, um, I guess, underlying statistics that make me say that you know compliance has been improving? Well, in that in that first reporting period I was talked about that ended on 30 June 2021, the, roughly the uh, from statements of compliant and non-compliant from how we assess them, and we're, remember we're assessing against the mandatory criteria as per the Act, uh, we had a figure of roughly 40% non-compliant, 60%. That was a rough figure uh, for the end of the first reporting period. But now, just for example, just in 2022, um, where we've already had over a thousand statements come in, because uh, there was a, you know, a late surge at the end of December as a, one of the reporting periods uh, came to its close. Um, that's why we had the team very busy the first three weeks of January. We just were assessing those 900 statements and got all those done and now all published. So that, uh, that was sort of the focus of my, my business engagement team with assistance very early in the year. So, but now as we speak today, there's over a thousand uh, statements have been assessed and the uh, for us the compliance rate we're seeing at the moment is about 80 percent to 20 80 percent compliant 20 percent non-compliant roughly um, uh, for, for the current figures another example is when i talked about that entities not getting the correct sign off whether it be approval or um, you know from the correct governance body uh, in the first reporting period i talked about ending june last year was about 27 percent of statements coming in uh, had a problem with that and again that thousand statements that I'm, I'm talking about that we've looked at uh coming in um this year the thousand we've seen already was is at 14 percent so there, there, there is some uh improvement there just in the bulk uh numbers uh other th in relation to compliance with the act the abf wrote there was a lot of was in non-compliance in that first reporting period we actually wrote to all entities who we considered not to have addressed all the managed reporting criteria uh for their first modern slavery statement uh, so we, we spent a bit of time doing that, reaching out to entities with that. Uh, and we're currently completing a more detailed analysis of, um, of entities who failed to submit a statement for the first reporting period. Uh, so we, you know, we're using a lot of tax data that didn't come until the end of last year. I mean, the first reporting period finished June last year, got some tax data late last year, and now we're in, a, in the final stages of analysing that information and start to um, uh, look, look for the entities that you know, should have reported that didn't. Uh, also, in relation to the compliance with the Act, we, we, we do things, uh, other things we uh, try to assist businesses in complying with the Act. We've developed a range of guidance materials to help reduce the frequency of errors. We've got about 13, I think, guidance products on our, they're on our uh, online register, and we'll, and we'll try uh, aim to develop those further this year. Uh, we have a number of resources on there, um, and the team, since it started, has provided over 2,400 2, responses to entities through our online help desk. So I'll show the details of the help desk at the end. We still have that help desk running and we've conducted, um, you know, 130 face-to-face -face and virtual awareness raising workshops and presentations uh, as well uh, as part of our trying to assist people in complying with the Act. Um, okay, another key one for us is the, the engagement with academia and civil society. I was talking earlier about that collaboration. Um, you know, we're committed to providing that greater transparency to the public by publishing all modern slavery statements that have met the appropriate approval requirements. 
So that's that's uh, so you can see there. That's why even uh, statements that aren't compliant with the Act get published um, because we want the we're promoting that transparency um, and and for research and 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 everyone to see the the effort that others are putting into uh, treating with treating this risk. So. Um, uh, and I think there's a disclaimer in there that which sort of indicates that not all statements on that register uh, have been assessed as compliant. Uh, they have, they have the, the key thing is they've met that approval and signature requirement. But we welcome the continued academic and civil society analysis and, and independent reports uh, of modern slavery statements published that are being published on our register and, and any sub, subsequent public discussion. And there's been some recent ones and then there's been then media discussion as well, which we welcome because that's what, again, the, the, the overall intent of that Act initially was that it's a transparency model, and we want we want um, you know lots of smart people getting together and analysing what's out there. And I've just highlighted there some of the you know four recent uh, reports that you know quite a few of them did involve media discussion. You know the Axie uh, 200 report, uh, which was done by uh, Pillar Two for Axie, uh, the Monash University report uh, that came out I think it was December last year, late last year. Uh, another one with uh, the Paper Promises report. Again, just coming out recently uh, by the um, uh, oh, what is it? The sorry, the Human Rights Law Centre with a number of entities under it. No, University of New South Wales and a few others uh, under it. But we certainly, um, you know, we read all these reports with interest, and we actually meet up with uh, these teams uh, when we can. So uh, my teams have already met up with the Monash University team. We'll, uh, we've already had some briefings by the um, Human Rights Law Centre team, and, and we're actually going to do more of that and follow that up. And there's another one there too. You can see there by Walk Free and Wiki Rates there. Most recent report uh, beyond compliance in the garment sector, assessing UK and Australian modern slavery act statements uh, in in the garment industry. And I've certainly had a uh, meeting with them to talk about their report as well. So you know we encourage those sorts of reports being uh, published, uh, analysing what what's there in the register. And to assist with that, uh, we work with a number of uh, resident of uh, so work with researchers to. Uh, implement a number of new features, the online register to assist research. And that's ongoing at the moment. We're, we're doing some technical uh, fixes to the register in the process of that. And so we certainly reached out to a number of these um, just uh, key research and civil society to uh, say, you know, what would help research better. And then we'll um, try and do as much as that we can now. And but then obviously note um, to improve it where we can in the future. Uh, all right, just a couple of other things about what the team does, um, which is relevant for you know implementing the Modern Slavery Act. We do then, uh, the, the Act says we have to publish an annual report on the implementation of the Act. The most recent one was published after our last meeting on the 25th of November. Um, and these are all available um, on our, uh, our website. Um, and yeah, th this report details the government's work to raise awareness of the Act, how we support good practice, practice um, and uh, the work we do to strengthen the government's response to modern slavery risks in its own supply chains and operations. But the 2021 annual report will be published this year. And that's when we aim to uh, provide a, a, you know, a, a bigger document, providing more detailed analysis of compliance with the Act over that first reporting period that I was talking about. So we're doing that at the moment. That report will come out uh, later this year. Uh, I just touch again quickly to talk about the, the Commonwealth statements that we have to um, produce as well. So the second one to uh, Commonwealth Modern Slavery Statement was released after the last one of these sessions. It's now available on the Modern Slavery Register, like everybody else's. Um, you know, and we adopted a risk-based approach in that, in that as well for us. You know, the Commonwealth is a huge uh, procurer. It's the largest procurer of goods and services in the Australian market. About seventy billion dollars a year through eighty thousand contracts uh, is the um, is our leverage. So, um, and that Commonwealth statement has to cover you know ninety eight. Uh, non-corporate non -corporate Commonwealth entities. So you can see there it is a fairly big undertaking, um, you know, and the Commonwealth is starting out as well, like other business have been over the last couple of years um, uh, to, to get their statements in order. So the key areas that we've been focusing on in our first, uh, and sorry, in our second com Commonwealth statement was, um, you know, investments, textile procurement, construction, cleaning and security services, and ICT hardware procurement were identified early as a lot of our, um, you know, the high risk areas uh, for us. And, you know, for our third Commonwealth statement that we're producing, we've really moved now from that discovery phase into our, uh, our implementation phase uh, of our own statement. So we're very busy now, uh, again, working with our 98 you know, non-corporate Commonwealth entities, uh, 
trying to get uh, a better understanding of our, our lower uh, tier, all, all of the lower tiers within our supply chains. And we do work with civil society and, and other groups to, to, to help us do that as well. So there is collaboration with us uh, in, in trying to do that. And um, so we're sort of at that, uh, if you like, that implementation phase of the Commonwealth Statement. So the third Commonwealth Statement, we are, you know, we're getting more detail now and getting direct inputs and more detailed inputs from those uh, lower levels within the Commonwealth. Uh, you know, the, the training and procurements going through and um, uh, uh, elements dealing with modern slavery and human trafficking going into, you know, our, our, our tender clauses in the, through our procurement offices. Um, and then we're going to start obviously pushing it now into contract management. So we're, we're, that's our sort of uh, our own journey with doing statements. Uh, just a, a bit on the Modern Slavery Act review that I talked about earlier. Um, you know, we, we have to commence a uh, legislative review of the Modern Slavery Act, uh, you know, in 2022. Uh, according to the Act, after three years, it does need to be reviewed. And then we've got 12 months to review it and get that a report into Parliament uh, about the recommendations. Um, and so that'll be tabled in Parliament, uh, you know, pretty much 12 months after it kicks off. And then the viewer will look at the first three years of the Act's operation and consider compliance with legislation um, and, and measures that could be uh, done to improve the Act. So it, yeah, it, it is a big year. It, it's, 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 it's been in place. You can see what the original intent of the Act was. Um, and you can see from a lot of those reports that have already come in and analysing the Act, which are great. You can see types of uh, issues that people are already raising and talking about. So it's going to be a great opportunity uh, this year for those who want to uh, influence or, um, you know, yeah, inf influence the, the future of the Act uh, in ways that will make it more effective. Well, uh, that window is um, will be opening this year. Um, but the exact timing process will be announced by the government in, in due course. So there's a lot of planning has gone into it now. We're just, um, you know, just waiting for the government now to announce uh, that, that final date where it kicks off. But it will be a it will be a collaborative and open uh, consultation process. There will be a lot of consultation uh, happening around the place, with you know, with with inputs from all, all sectors of society. Um, you know, we'll obviously put out you know consult, consultation paper, have have those meetings, etc. Consult, consultative meetings uh, to really uh, try and improve this act. Um, and that was really it from me. As I mentioned earlier, we do have a help desk there at that slavery consultations email address there. That is the team's help desk. Um, we do have that guidance for reporting entities there on our register and there's a link for the register, but it's, you know, it's Google online mod slave register. There it is. And um, that's really it for me. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Todd. Great. Uh, and uh, just to share some compliments that have been coming through whilst we've been speaking, it's great uh, to see how open the ABF is to so show everything, warts and all. So that's really good. Uh, a couple of questions I'll just fire at you and I'm trying to sort of uh, consolidate them. What are the consequences for non-compliance? And how detailed is the feedback um, to entities where they might not be non-compliant? Those are a few questions rolled into one. I don't know if you can address those uh, one at a time. That'd be brilliant. Yeah, well, I guess the, the first, uh, initially the, the, the policy was um, uh, implemented. So you know, the, the first phase of the act was to really work with business, I guess, in a consultative manner to help them, uh, you know, lodge statements and, and do the right thing. So that's really been the, the focus in the first phase. And the, the Act in, in, in relation to compliance, um, you know, it, it doesn't have a great deal of, if you like, power. It's not, it's not remember, it's a, the Toronto's reputation as a Transparency Act, not one where you go with the people with a big stick um, yet. Uh, that's, so the Act, really, that the in, in compliance, if entities uh, aren't compliant, uh, the ultimate, I guess, power of the minister is naming and shaming. Um, but I said, but the emphasis has been that first uh, phase is to work with entities. And when we have gone out to entities, I mean, there's a lot of entities. Our, our team uh, just goes out uh, entities with a brief uh, comment of where, what, what criteria they've, you know, not met, and then where they can get help to them improve in that, um, where they can get help to improve. So again, you know, said so there's obviously a lot of entities there that at first contact has been just highlighting, you know, you're not meeting these criteria. And then we point them in the right direction of where you can improve those. Um, that's, yeah, hopefully I've, I've answered that one. Thanks, Todd. Uh, maybe a question for um, James. Um, sort of the, the ultimate sort of uh, resolution is to just uh, find a new supplier. What, uh, what impact can that have 
on the victims that are, are, are literally the victim of the issue that we're, we're trying to sort of uh, avoid and mitigate? How can we help that situation that we don't make it even worse for them? So this is a great question on two levels. First of all, it, it's a tough question to answer, but it, secondly, it's great that people are asking this question because it shows that what is sinking in is that the, the orientation of the obligations under both the Modern Slavery Act and more broadly the international standard with which that is aligned, the UN guiding principles, is that you shouldn't cut and run, that you should seek to engage with suppliers that have forced labour issues in their production processes and remediate those problems over time. It's a, it's a relationship question. But there are cases where when you go through all of that uh, process, you've done your due diligence, you've built leverage, you've used that leverage, you still end up at the bottom of the decision tree at this horrible box where it has no effect. And in very, very rare, severe cases, we may get straight to that box because there are obstacles to doing effective remediation on the ground. Uh, in fact, doing remediation on the ground may make the risks to people worse. And mm -hmm. Xinjiang, according to the top human rights organizations and the top business and human rights organizations in the world, seems, alas, to be one of those cases where effective engagement on the ground is just not possible in part because this is state-backed forced labour. This is a bit different from the forced labour that arises because of the choices of individual businesses, which is the case in most of the uh, most of the supply chains you're dealing with. Here, we've got a very powerful government that has adopted a policy that subsidises for businesses uh, the use of forced labour and that criminalises the ability of manufacturers in uh, China to even answer uh, straightforwardly or truthfully or reliably your due diligence questions. So that brings us to this problem. What do we, how does us disengaging have a positive impact for people on the ground? The answer is it doesn't solve the problem for them, but it doesn't make the problem worse. This is about essentially a do no harm situation. But it goes back to this point that in rare cases like this, there's a need for collective effort by multiple business entities, by investors and by government to think through what the solution is for those people who remain in that difficult situation. Now, one ar argument is that when that demand for their services dries up, when the demand for particular goods drives, dries up, they'll be moved into other industries and maybe they'll be, be moved out of forced labour. Frankly, it's too early to tell whether that logic is going to play out. But that appears to be the situation we're in. So normally the answer would be absolutely stay, engage, solve the problem. But this is one of those rare cases where, in fact, we have to be thinking about phase disengagement and sourcing alternative supply. Over. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jim. T uh, Todd, I might just give you sort of a, a, a few seconds to answer that too. What's the ABF's take on that? Um, well, uh, I think as I said earlier, there's, there's, I guess, government legislation before the, um, uh, you know, before the parliament at the moment. And yeah, I guess it's just, it's just, I mean, it's not my job to comment on the policy and where it go. You know, I'll implement whatever policy I get given. Yeah, that, that's what I do. So I can't really comment on on the policy or where things should go. Other than say, you know, obviously collaboration is key. Um, and there's all different types of levers and, levers and things being tried out there. There's things before our parliament. Um, which is have had just recently, I guess, the autonomous sanctions um, legislation come in, which is now being used uh, right now, and only came in in November uh, or late last year. It, it's being used. Uh, so yeah, it is. It's it's a it's a it's a tough issue. But I you know I just at the moment, me you know, just my team is just implementing the the Transparency Act that's in place in front of me. Uh, what else is the levers the government going to pull? Well, again, that that is up to the government, um, and then whatever you know levers then they want us to pull, you know, we'll do it. So yeah, sorry if it's a. I, I can't sort of comment on, on the, the the policy and what, what's good and bad there really. Other than say that, um, other than say you know obviously collaboration is key and there's things happening. There's things before the parliament, um, but you know, as as the border force, we will execute what uh, policy gets put in front of us. I've got a question for you, Todd. Probably on that kind of similar topic. 
Obviously, reporting on modern slavery is not an easy task, and particularly when we're looking at this kind of phased approach to disengaging with suppliers and whatnot. Um, I'm sure that a lot of the attendees here who are kind of involved from their business perspective in in writing that modern slavery statement, it's not it's not necessarily yeah an, an easy task to kind of start with and continue with. What kind of resources are out there for? Um, whether that's from the ABF or broader government bodies in terms of assisting them with writing the modern slavery statement and then also addressing some of these issues. Yeah, well, I, get, I mean, the first thing is obviously point to our our register, but um, uh, which 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 has uh, some material. But I guess there's just some great civil, um, I guess, agencies out there now that do you know provide it's 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 there's a business out there and they do this for a living now provide. Uh, mm -hmm businesses advice on how to do this and um you know See. it's a lot, a lot of experienced uh, people out there doing that sort of stuff obviously can't mm -hmm. advocate a particular one but um you know some very you know experienced smart people um and some of them you know <laughs> got ex-government people in them as well uh so i've got that mixture uh providing that advice so there are those sorts of organizations you know we have our resources on the web um and then it's and it's like, it's like for us too with our our commonwealth writing team we're, we're learning as well who to collaborate with where to look um you know i was just on the phone yesterday with the oecd uh responsible business uh, uh sort of area just with them and i was asking them these exact questions too you know where's but where's sort of the the best practice here and um so using you know so we've got access to a heap of i guess online oecd resources just there from their responsible business area so we're doing a lot of searching ourselves um and so i think that you know the best way to do it um is yeah you've got to look at those areas that have been doing it for some of those countries that have been doing this sort of thing for a while um whether mm -hmm. being you know due diligence uh, as well as the modern slavery side of the house you get some experienced government areas there and what are they doing uh, you have international organizations like the oecd um and then you have those civil community or you know commercial enterprises now that specialize in this and and we have our resource register but yeah we probably need to update that this year to ourselves so i really now that we're learning we need to see what we can uh, put on there as well um so yeah i think it's an area too where the, the knowledge and expertise is growing um it was interesting i've asked a couple of experts recently like you know which governments do best practice in public procurement i'll be saying that to some of the uh you know commercial entities or OECDs and they'll often refer to the I guess the, the what they call the Nordic countries I'd say you know a lot of them have been doing this for a while or the Norways the Swedens yeah. have sort of been doing this for a while if you want to see people do this thing well or governments do this well they sort of said that, that there's good examples there um, so we're doing things like that um, so yeah we'll, we'll, we'll try and update our resource point but it's, it's a it's a growing area everybody's learning Absolutely. It's definitely developing kind of, you know, the modern slavery statement and act is quite new and it, you know, it's obviously going to develop more and more as the years go on and, you know, as the process matures. So I can appreciate that for sure. Yeah. Maybe just a quick question, uh, a bit, bit left field for you, Todd, here as well. Um, we, I've seen some statements where um, an organisation might have, at a guess, 10 or 15,000 tier one suppliers. And their statement is based on, I don't know, engaging with a couple of hundred suppliers and sort of tracking those over time. Is there going to be at any time maybe some kind of KPIs or minimum? This is what you've got to do. You've got to cover, I don't know, 80 percent of your spend in your statement. Are there any sort of KPIs being considered on that front going forward? Yeah, I think mean, that's a good question. And we've we've got like the Australian Institute of Criminology sort of help, helping us a bit too at the moment. Look at you know how you assess effectiveness. Um, and I mean, you know, the act right now is pretty. You know, it, it doesn't really go into quality that much. That's right. Mm. So there's so mm. that, I guess that's going to be part of the review. Where does it um, where, where does it go from here? So um, and then you've got to make sure you, you can you can implement it. And then you've got the resources to implement it. Um, I think when I, I know every, every time I've had a brief by those. You know, big academic institutions which have done some great reports i always say to them so what resources did you put into doing this a 40 page report on 100 entities and some of them is like oh we had nine people full-time for three months and three of them had phds so you know that's there's that just sort of shows you and one of one of them was like two years 12 people type stuff um yep. to do this analysis so it you know it you, you need a lot of staff then to obviously check and police that if you're going to sort of in, put that sort of stuff in but you're right we do need to go to 
boost quality. Um, but yeah, but then just what mechanisms can you do to do it? So we don't have it there at the moment. We are, we are looking at it. The review is certainly going to discuss it. So this year, the review will discuss that, no doubt. So we'll, And we'll just see what comes out of the review and just hope that whatever comes out of the review, they give us enough resources to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, thanks for that, Todd. Yeah, I guess it, it is a challenge. I guess it, it, it drives that point home of collaboration as well. James, I'll, in a second, I saw your hand raised. Good etiquette here. <laughs> uh, no, I, th I think collaboration there rears its head as well because uh, people have uh, are resource poor. Uh, and just on that that matter, we've seen quite a significant growth on the consortium side, which is really good to see that industries are really starting to collaborate in that space. Over to you, James. There we go. Sorry oh, about yeah, that. I had good. trouble unmuting. Um, thanks, thanks, Nicholas. I, you know, it's not for me to comment on how the Australian government is going to implement uh, an Australian uh, Act of Parliament, but there are two things that I think are hugely valuable in the way that the, that. Uh, Australia has implemented the MSA today. One is that it's been relentlessly principled and it's said that the MSA aligns with international standards to which we're committed, such as the UN guiding principles. And the second is that it's been relentlessly pragmatic and it said, we recognise that we can't go from zero to 100 immediately. This is going to be a ratchet process. Everybody has, as you heard in Todd's excellent answer, people have scarce resources. We have to be realistic while still being ambitious and pushing forward to meet you know, those international standards. So in thinking about this question, how do we allocate scarce resources to investigate risk in the supply chain? I think it, oh, and in our operations, it's crucial to look at best practice internationally, the kinds of uh, kinds of materials that Todd was pointing to from the OECD Responsible Business Conduct Unit, for example. And the key answer that's embedded in the guiding principles and the OECD norms is it's a question of salience. So the issue is not how close are you to another firm, how many tiers in away from you are they in the supply chain, how long standing or established is the business relationship. The key question is how salient is the risk that that firm poses to people? And salience is a term that means something quite specific in this area. It's about the severity of the risk, it's about the scope of the risk, and it's about how remediable the risk would be if it were realised. Now, there's a, a big literature out there. There are um, for-profit and not-for-profit entities in Australia that advise on exactly what that means. But the crucial thing to get across here is if you focus your scarce due diligence resources on those parts of uh, your supply and operations where you're exposed to the most severe risks at the largest scale, like, for example, Xinjiang, um, then you can have comfort that you are aligning with the international standard and anybody, whether it's the Australian government uh, or anybody else who's reviewing your practice is, is probably pretty likely to give you a big tick for that. So I think that's really crucial to get to, across to people that it's about the risks to people drives where the, the resources need to be allocated, not necessarily the risk to the business. Over. Totally agree. Thanks, James, for that. I'm painfully aware that we've just hit the, the uh, 12.30 mark here. I might just ask Elaine a quick question around the resources. You mentioned some very good resources in line with uh, James's statement as well. Uh, can those be made available to all the attendees? And whilst you've got uh, the mic, um, what are your sort of part, last sort of words? What's your takeaway? What what would you suggest uh, people do on their journey here in this modern slavery ethical sourcing space? Um, so in terms of resources, the resources we've developed, um, we are currently, I think I put a comment in the, the chat function. Uh, we come up, we're currently um, putting together a standalone um, web page on our website and for what it's worth, we will share as much as we can there. So I've seen a couple of comments about sharing particular resources I mentioned. So uh, keep your eye out on the Benevolent Society website and we'd be very happy to share uh, what we have there. In terms of any kind of observations or final comments, um, I would really share um, the view around salient human rights issues. And uh, we are an organisation that have just has just undergone that process of identifying salient human rights issues being guided by the UN guiding 
um, principles. Um, and I think it's a very uh, good governing framework in terms of identifying where resources need to go. So the Benevolent Society, uh, we are an organisation that meets um, the, the threshold for reporting, but we, we are also one that has scarcity of resources. We face that just as much as probably some others um, that have joined the core today. So we it's predominantly led by um, uh, the legal team here at the Benevolent Society. The legal team is very small. There's two lawyers and one paralegal, um, but but it's not, it's not uh, we lead it but it's championed by representatives across the entire organisation. So when we talk about um, resources, whilst there may be a function that leads it, um, uh, don't forget, I mean, this is also why uh, we took a view that it has to be embedded in our culture, not just in one single portfolio, one director. Everyone needs to understand this. I mean, it's no good if I'm the only one who understands what the salient human rights issues of the Benevolent Society are. Everyone needs to get involved. And I think um, because we're a not-for-profit, um, I think there might be an assumption that, well, that's that would be easy because, you know, we work in a not-for-profit. That's the nature of what we do. But we all work with people. So reiterating that point, risk to people, that's key to kind of this this journey. And, and I would suggest, um, you know, we all we are all, uh, you know, part, uh, people organisations. So we should be led by that. Perfect. No, Thank thanks. You. Embedded in the organisation and it's a risk to people that is the key driver. Totally agree with you there, Elaine. Uh, James, your final comments as well, and then over to you, Todd. Sorry, still glitches with the software. Good way to end it as we started there. <laughs> but I, look, I honestly don't have any, anything more to add than that. I think that is a really critical step. And it's great to see that the community of practice around these issues is coming to terms with this large cultural transformation that's required here. Yes, this starts from a place about compliance, but this is a really fundamental shift in the way the market understands risk, the way the government regulates risk, and therefore your orientation to risk in the way that you interact with people with your customers, your clients. I think uh, there's no better way to put that than, than Elaine did. So just a big congratulations to everybody for getting this far. Uh, still a long way to go, but thank you also to Inform365 for, for convening this conversation. Thank you, James. Over to you, Todd, final words. I just final words for me, uh, two key points is that, is that collaboration is key. We know we can't do it on our own. You can't sort of abdicate responsibility. That's why I love turning up things like this. So yeah, some of those uh, comments from Elaine and James before, I learn something new every day when I'm here. So yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm learning, we acknowledge that, uh, but you've got to keep collaborating um, and, um, and and you know get those lessons out for other people to learn from so we, we can all learn, fr learn from it. Um, you know, for example, we do have an advisory group made up of business, civil society and, and unions and government that advises us on implementing the Act. So that collaboration is there. We've got to keep it going. And just to highlight again people to, uh, to people that we are reviewing that Act this year. So when it does come out, if, if people want to influence where the Act goes, then that's it. You know, get involved. So um, that's it for me. I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much, everybody. No, brilliant. Uh, I hope everyone agrees that was a smash, smashing session. I think we'll have to extend it to two hours next time because we barely scratched the surface of all the great questions that came in. So thanks everyone for attending. I won't keep you any longer. If you've got any questions, you've got the contact details down there. We will be sending out the recording to all registered uh, uh, attendees, but also um, we'll send out the Q&As that we didn't get uh, onto. So thanks everyone. Uh, take care and stay safe and look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks.